Good morning. Welcome to Plateau Christian Church. We're so glad you're here with us. Would you stand and worship this morning?
Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Sing that one more time. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. And great are you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Everybody go ahead and grab a seat, please, and welcome to Plateau Christian. How's everybody doing today? Good. Excellent. Excellent. So we've got a few announcements we want to go through here, and uh, we see some love going on, so that's a good thing. <laughs> we should have more huggings, right? So Michelle will hug anybody. Let me just tell you. <laughs> that's awesome. Next Sunday is the picnic, so it's a good time to get together and have a meal together. Uh, also, during the picnic or right after at 1 o'clock, there's going to be a men's meeting. So it's more of an organizational meeting. So if you want to come and join for the picnic, uh, stay for the men's meeting at 1 down there at the pavilion. Uh, it'll be a short meeting to tell you what's going on. Um, also, we've got um, the Wednesday bonfire. Uh, right now, it's about 58% chance of rain. If you look at the calendar, like on you know Weather Channel, 58% chance of rain like every day of the week. I don't know how they come up with the percentages, but it's all 58, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> so, but if we're not having a, a, a rain, we're going to have the bonfire down there Wednesday nights uh, and maybe even a slip and slide. So if it rains, that may be more fun as long as there's no lightning. So <laughs> that may help with the water situation. Um, Thursday men's Bible study starts again in August, so it's on pause until then. Uh, still have the women's going on. Friday, Bible study still at Weston Anna's, so if you want to get in on that, uh, come see us. Uh, baptism Sundays are going to be the fourth Sundays now of the month. So um, it's not heated right now, but we can heat it up for anybody that wants to jump in today and become a, become a follower. Um, Russell Smith, who broke his, you know, had the ATV accident, him and his wife, um, he's still struggling uh, down in Atlanta, but it turns out, uh, Rick found out some more information, it's basically all bones above his waist were broke. So I, I couldn't imagine that. I don't know, you know, you would think a full body cast at that point, but, you know, there's nothing to attach to for making things heal correctly and bones. So it's, a, it's a still a tough going for him, you know, no use of arm and, as well as leg. And, um, so just be praying for the Smith family. Uh, they own a couple businesses in town, so you might know them. Um, Rick's friend Tammy also, uh, out west, the one that had the heart attack, she's 34. Um, still be praying for that family and for her. There's a lot of things uh, involved with that family. There's, uh, you know, just some drug stuff. Um, there's son in the past that, you know, committed suicide right beside her. Uh, so that's got to be a tough, tough thing to go through in life. And then you had this heart attack at such a young age. So be praying for that family and for any of those who have loved ones who are, you know, sick, ill, um, going through cancer. Uh, just be praying for them and uh, make sure we keep those in our prayers during the week, not just on Sundays here. Um, we've got uh, Day's friend had a stroke um, from first service, so be praying for that. Uh, Michelle's friend, Alice, so we need to be praying for her. Uh, coming up on some medical treatments, but be praying also for her salvation too. So, um, any other prayer requests or praises? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
bunko and laughter, that's a good thing. Uh, anyone else got anything? Nothing at all. Okay. Um, if you will, we're going to uh, go ahead and continue in service. But before we do, uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from the Word of God if we can. This is uh, Psalm 29. So give Adonai his due, you who are godly. Give Adonai his due of glory and strength. Give Adonai the glory due his name. Worship Adonai in splendor. So let's pray. Lord, we come before you now. Uh, we are in awe of you. And we come before and worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, Lord, may the songs that we sing, the words that we have that are in our hearts be magnifying and glorifying your name above all names. Cast out the things of this world that are upon us. Lord, we pray for those who are needy and sick and need healing. Lord, may your spirit move within them for those that do not know you. Lord, may all of us be those disciples, those hands and feet that Paul was, uh, that we will learn about today even more. Lord, we trust you, we love you, and we obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship this morning? stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare your promise, my soul now to stay. So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely.
So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Sing that one more time. So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. He came to love. He left for He bled and died to buy my pardon and empty grave is there to prove my Savior. Because he lived, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. I know He holds the future And life is worth the living 
just because he lives and then one day I'll cross that river I'll find life's fine No war with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory And I'll know He reigns Because He lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I. Life is worth the living just because He lives, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future Life is worth the living just because He lives. And life is worth the living just because He lives. Lord, this morning, we just come before you and we are so thankful to be in your house this morning. God, we thank you for the sacrifice that you sent in your son, Jesus Christ. That God, that we have a life worth living. And God, that we may have a relationship with you because he lives. God, this morning, we just ask that your, that God, that your spirit would remain in this place. God, you would be with us as we open up your scripture, and God, as we study your word, and God, that you would open our hearts and our eyes for the message that you have for us this morning. God, we love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 10, and while you're turning, let me just tell you my trials and tribulations. So um, I've actually got next week's sermon uh, started, mostly finished, and, and um, so pray that I don't get confused and preach one or both sermons at the same time. Uh, and they do kind of go together. Acts 10 is kind of the intro. Acts 11 is, uh, is the boys going back home and reporting what happened with the Gentiles. And um, 
Uh, so that's what's happening. Now, uh, today in Acts chapter 10, it's titled The Gentiles. And the first point is witnessing God at work. Now, now keep in mind what has happened thus far in our study of the book of Acts. The church was launched in chapter uh, 1 and 2. Uh, Jesus meets with us, uh, his apostles and he tells them that uh, they're going to go and they're going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the othermost parts of the earth. Uh, he has told them from the very, very beginning that the gospel was going to be for everyone. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, stands up preaches from the book of Joel and, uh, and quotes the passage that says, I will pour forth my spirit upon all my people. They, uh, they got fat and happy. They stayed in Jerusalem and Judea. The church grew to tens of thousands. Uh, it was just their, if you want to think of it as a uh, just an idyllic period. This was their Camelot time. It was just uh, miracles happening, all kinds of good things. Everyone loved the disciples or the the church, other than the the uh, Jewish leadership. You know, they got blowback and, and persecution from them. Everything was going well as far as the average person. They were pretty popular. Uh, the church itself took care of one another. I mean, it, it was it's like we hear once in a while. Uh, when when folks have left, they've had to move away. Uh, we saw uh, we saw some folks this uh, past week who have moved away, and they, they were back in town, and they just said, "We can't find a church like you." You know, it's just, it's just we, we miss it so much. Uh, that sort of thing. Well, that was the church in the early days, but something had not happened. We are now at Acts chapter 10. It is likely 10 years since Jesus' resurrection. It's 10 years since the day of Pentecost. And they have not preached to the rest of the world. There was a little bit of a kickstart in Acts chapter 8 when, uh, when God used the opportunity uh, that came about with the persecution following Stephen stoning. As Saul is persecuting the church, the church flees Jerusalem, and, and, and Samaria, finally, is started to be evangelized. But they don't count from the Jewish perspective because the, the Jews were very, very, very bigoted people. They, they had listened to, to God's word and kind of taken part of it. So they, they were very much filled with the idea, hey, I'm Jewish and I am, well, I'm one of the promised people. Um, but they took it as, I'm one of the promised people and we're better than you. They even thought that about the Samaritans, which Samaritans were kind of halfway. They were half-breeds. And, uh, and so when they started to be evangelized, it wasn't too much of a challenge. However, for both Samaritans and Gentiles both, the, the, um, the Jewish people looked upon them with revulsion. I've told you this story before. If they went to a market and a Gentile sold them food, they would purposely buy only food that had a peel or a rind to it so that they could, they could peel off the filth of the Gentile on that food. They would only eat the food that was inside. Now, how much do you have to hate someone in order to get to that point? That's where they were. And now it's 10 years later, and they still haven't done what Jesus commanded them to do. Had things been pretty good? Well, yes, they had. As a matter of fact, it's a great picture of a church in the midst of comfort. When, when churches get too comfortable, sometimes we don't move. Sometimes we just don't do the things that we ought to do because what we've done is we've created church for ourselves and not the church that God wants from us. And that is to be a beacon, to be a light, to be an influence upon society. And they had, but only in their own little corner of the world. So now God's going to get things kick-started again. And that's what we're going to find here in chapters uh, 10 and following. It takes a little while uh, to get these guys uh, uh, out of their comfort zone. And God's the one who really moves this. He's the one who, who makes this happen. So 
Let's look at two important personalities in the midst of this. God is at work. He's pushing things. He's making the church do what he wants them to do. And we start with this guy named Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He's a believer in God. He, uh, uh, he is following the Jewish Old Testament. He's, uh, he's also doing things that win the Jewish people over to him. Uh, and he is a regular worshiper of God. He, he prays and worships uh, uh, the, the God Yahweh. So Cornelius gets contacted by God. He listens. And Cornelius, more importantly, obeys. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what is now known as the Italian Regiment, which is a, um, that was a pretty highfalutin uh, regiment. They, they had a great reputation. Uh, he was probably at the top of the heap being a centurion, and he likely had uh, quite a bit in the way of resources, personally. Verse 2, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, I'd pay attention, wouldn't you? Yeah, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. In other words, hey, God's paying attention. Would you pay attention now? Yeah, I sure will. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. Now for Old Testament believers, when you hear Joppa, all of a sudden you start to pay attention. When we left off last week in chapter 9, and if, um, we're so thankful for Dundee being here. But when we left off at chapter 9, Peter had gone to Joppa, and Dorcas was healed there. But Joppa has another distinction in the, in the Old Testament. For our, our men's Bible study, we should know, because we're just finished up this past Thursday on the book of Jonah, which Joppa is where Jonah ran to as he's running from God, as he's fleeing God out of rebellion, by the way. This is not just the reluctant uh, prophet. Jonah is the rebellious prophet. And why? Well, because that some people are just not worth saving sort of mentality. That's what Jonah had. Most of us know Jonah from five verses. He Runs from God, uh, he's thrown overboard, uh, and uh, he gets swallowed by a great fish, and then he gets vomited up on the, on the sand. And, and that's what we know from Jonah from our youth. There's 43 other verses in Jonah. And the real big issue was Jonah did not agree with God that the Ninevites were worthy of God's redemption. He didn't want to preach to him. He didn't want to preach a, a story of repentance. As a matter of fact, when, when we look at the book of uh, Jonah and we get to the last chapter, here's old Jonah pouting outside the city. He's preached to them. They've repented. And then he, he sees something that he just did not want to see. He sees that God forgave the people. They had repented, and that was enough for God and so what did Jonah do? He goes outside the city and he pouts. So I'm going to stop right here. Because I think there's a reason why Peter was in Joppa, not just for Dorcas, not just for this little vision that Peter's going to see, but I think it's also a little hint as to God's direction in the midst of this. And so I'm going to ask you, I'll ask you this several times in the sermon. But what's your Nineveh? Right now, as we look in this vast culture war that we've got, who and what is it that in your mind, either the person is repugnant or their lifestyle is repugnant, something you hate, or you just kind of fix it in your mind, there's no way this person is worthy of God's forgiveness. Because that's really what this whole story is about. 
That's what's going on in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 and following. Because the Gentiles were loathsome people to the Jewish people. And here is something that just goes against the grain for most of the Jews. It was incomprehensible to them what was coming. I think it's a story for us today because for some lifestyle situations or some people, it's just inconceivable in our minds, I think, to believe they could come to Christ. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I have two friends in Florida. Connie, who I went to high school with, she and I were in the same youth group way back in the ancient of days. And, uh, and uh, uh, she and I are longtime friends. I go back to Florida. I'm on staff uh, at the church in Florida. And uh, Connie and Tony show up. And so it was this renewed friendship. And uh, she brings in somebody new, and that's her husband, Tony. And Tony was an interesting guy. Just he couldn't. Everybody loves Tony. But I'm teaching a class on forgiveness. And I just throw out this supposition. This is years and years and years ago. I throw out this supposition about who we might meet in heaven that uh, we didn't think would ever get there. And not long before that, uh, James Dobson had gone to Florida State Prison and had sat down with Ted Bundy. And you remember the serial murderer, Ted Bundy. And reportedly, Ted Bundy came to Christ and was baptized by James Dobson in Florida State Prison. And he was now, just before he died, Ted Bundy was claiming to be a Christian. And so I just threw out, uh, well, we might just see Ted Bundy in heaven. Tony didn't like that. Uh, he stood up and he said, there's no way that SOB is going to be in heaven. And Connie just tries to calm him down, takes him out of the room. I think sometimes we have that attitude about some people, don't we? That some people are just unredeemable. They can't be forgiven. That it's just impossible. And so Joppa is dropped in right here. And I think it's a good reminder of Jonah and the Ninevites, because of what's coming. Verse 6. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, this Peter that Cornelius is supposed to go see, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now, the second person we're going to meet here is Peter. And this is Peter, after all. I mean, Peter, who throughout the Gospels, it just he was great at saying the wrong thing. He was, he was the guy who was going to mess up no matter what. This, this was the friend that you have that um, is just going to do something stupid. And you know he's going to do something stupid. That was Peter in the Gospels. Remember him? But boy, does he change. He, he after, the, after the Pentecost, after the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Peter is the one who stands up on the day of Pentecost. He's the one who preaches a great sermon from the book of Joel. Peter is the one who kind of leads the charge. So here we have Peter. He listens, too, to God, and he, too, obeys. Verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And whilst the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And here's the big verse, verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. How deep does your Jewishness go? It goes deep. 
By the way, there is every indicator that the Jewish Christians continued in their Jewishness. They continued to do uh, just the things that are uh, bound them to the law. They didn't let go of it. Even though Paul says things like, you're free, they, he, Paul himself, still followed the Jewish customs and the Jewish laws. Still Christian, free from the burden of the law, but still honoring their past and still honoring what they had been bound to. That's why I think it's so profound when we like take and look at some of the things that we kind of make excuses for. What are some of the things we make excuses for? Um, like we don't have to chur uh, attend church. Uh, I've had people tell me that uh, they could worship God on top of a mountain. Uh, and then you, they never darken the door of a church. Well, it's true. You can worship God on the top of the mountain. But we're commanded in Scripture that we're to gather together to encourage one another to love and good works. Or the folks who just, uh, they say, well, um, uh, I don't have to give. And they point to uh, various verses. And there's all kinds of arguments where they don't have to give at church. And yet, Scripture says we are to give, and there's every indicator that these early Christian Jews not only gave their 10% every year to the temple and another 10% to the priests, and every third year 10% to the poor, but then on top of that they gave to the church and they gave to the work of the church. They gave and gave and gave. Or what about that whole forgiveness thing? We make excuses for that too. Yes, I'm bound to forgive. Scripture commands me to forgive. But, and it always has to do with just how repugnant that other person is. And all the reasons why we don't have to forgive them. Or baptism. We make excuses about that. I mean, we go on and on and on. And so here's Peter. He's on top of this roof. He's still in his Jewishness, and here comes this vision. Verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, and that's coming, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. So here's Peter up on the roof, the vision three times, and here comes Cornelius' men. It's coming. Peter is going to find out the meaning of that vision. They called out, verse 18, asking if Simon, who is known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. So there we have it, our two personalities, Cornelius, Peter, and here is, is the crossroads of a monumental event in the history of the church. It's a monumental event in the history of mankind. This is the story of the Gentiles and the Jews. But it's also, as you see at this next little point, it's when God kicks in the doors. Have you ever had God kick in the door for you? Have you ever had God just cause you to stop and think, Think about what he really wants in your life. And then are you like every person? You just kind of have those excuses. I've kind of detailed a few of them. My life has changed a lot from the early days. I remember the days when Suzanne and I couldn't uh, rub two nickels together. When there was too much week and too little paycheck. You remember those days? I remember one time when she and I are sitting on, on a sofa in Albany, Georgia, and the kids are little, and we're just kind of struggling. And she goes digging around just to find a few little um, bits of money. 
in order for us to, uh, I forget what we were going to do. And I just remember she found a check that we had forgotten about. And, uh, and man, was it a profound moment. But it's also about the time that we started to realign our finances. In other words, we started to stop making excuses when it came to God. And we started to do things like get our bills in line, but take care of God first. Something amazing happened, and I've told you guys this before. I left the business world where I made two and three times as much as I do now. Ironically enough, we have more now than we've ever had in our life. We live pretty comfortably. I mean, we're not rich <laughs> by any means. But when you make God your first priority, things change. It's just, it's just so true. This, this kind of ties into a story that I think is uh, very apropos for this story this week. I always find God creates life events. So last Sunday... I hop in the Subaru after church and take Jackson to camp. And uh, taking him to, uh, to church camp, which is in Ozone, and then drive off from there uh, to Knoxville. And the, the plan was to go visit that young woman, 35 years old, who's, um, who's had a heart attack. I truly expected her to, uh, to be on life support when I got there. I was trying to want, trying to figure out how I could satisfy her um, her aunt's request that I go over and lay hands on her, pray for her, and possibly be able to talk to her about the gospel. That was the big concern because I truly anticipated this woman being in a coma. So as I get over to Oak Ridge, Suzanne's Subaru. And keep in mind, one of the things that we do, we just don't have car payments. I don't like car payments. Don't, you know, I, I went and looked at a, at a new truck the other day, and, and I just, no, no, I don't want car payments. I just don't. Our newest car is eight years old. Our oldest car is 32 years old. And we're, I'm driving over there, and I get just outside of Oak Ridge, and all of a sudden, Suzanne's Subaru clicks and every single warning light that there is in a Subaru went off. I mean, it was, oh, wow. You know, it's, I, the eyesight's no longer working. It's all kinds of craziness. I'm four miles away from the Oak Ridge exit, which also happens to be, by the way, where the Subaru dealership is. And so I'm thinking, hmm, well, it's still running. Could I risk going to Knoxville or not, I'm praying the whole time. Lord, what do you want me to do? And immediately, it was, this is a sign from God. So I pull off at Oak Ridge, park it at the Subaru, get a little frustrated that their uh, key drop slot isn't working, that I'm going to have to come back Monday and drop the key off anyway. You know, that's 45 miles, I think, one way for us. And, um, and so, um, I'm figuring, well, Lord, you're just, you're talking to me. And so I, I texted the aunt, I texted Katie, and I just said, I think this is a sign from God. I couldn't make it over. I'm not going to get there. And in the back of my mind, as I'm saying, I think this is a sign from God, it, the idea came to me that she would be, she would be, uh, the niece would be in a different condition on Monday. There was a reason for that stop. I can tell you that I got on the phone with the serviceman after I dropped off the keys, and about the time that I went over and saw this woman, I got the bad news that the repairs were $3,800. You want to know a praise? There was a time in her life that would have overwhelmed us. It would have crushed us. We would have, man, uh, it would have been the end of the world. But it was easily it just came out of our checkbook. It was just it was a minor inconvenience. It just is. But the real praise was it happened at the same time that I'm over in Knoxville and I go walking in and just in front of me was a man and I find out it's the woman's brother. And I didn't know he was going to be there. So he and I talk. We go into her room in ICU 
and she's sitting up and there's nurses that are combing out her hair. And I get to talk to her, but I also get the story and I talk to the brother. And when we just talked Jesus, and she needed to know Jesus, first question is, what's your relationship with the Lord? Well, I don't go to church, you know, but I know him. So we talk more intently, and I pray with her, and I pray with him. But I find out more. It's not just she's 35 years old and had a heart attack. It was, uh, it's, she's 34 years old. Her mother died when she was 38 from a heart attack. Yes, the woman has a 10-year-old son, but she also had a 12-year-old son, and the 12-year-old took his life sitting next to her on the bed. And the woman has meth mouth, you know, having worked in a meth treatment center, I know the signs. She needed Jesus at that moment. I don't know how far it'll go. But I'm praising God for a $3,800 car repair. Why? Because it was a sign from God. And it got me out of my comfort zone, yes, but you know what? God's the one who gave me the 3800 to be able to do that. He's going to have more. He, he never has disappointed me. All I needed was the step of faith to go out and just make him first. And when God kicks in doors, you've got to pay attention. That, by the way, is what's happening here. This is... This is Peter's Subaru moment. This is his Nineveh moment. This is a chance for something big to happen. And you see it right here in verse 23. God's kicking in the doors. Remember, the church hadn't done what they were supposed to be doing. They hadn't evangelized the Gentiles. And in verse 23, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out, along, uh, out with them. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and they called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Keep in mind, the Jew, the old Jew, would have been repulsed by the Gentile. Keep in mind that the, the Jew would have brought condemnation upon himself for even entering into or meeting with the Gentile. And watch what happens. So as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. What had Cornelius done? He invited others, not just his family. Remember, that soldier is also a believer. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. The fact that I'm here is a miracle. This is my God moment, is what Peter is saying. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So I ask the question again, what's your Nineveh? What group of people or or what lifestyle or what, what sin is so repugnant to you that you believe they are unworthy of God's redemption? That's a question we should ask right here because that's where Peter is at that point. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered three days ago. I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. I, should, I would add, um, I guess that means I have to pay attention. Yeah, and he did. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And here it is. I'll go ahead and give you this point right up front. This is the main point. This is the biggie. The gospel is good news for all. And in parentheses, you see here, and God means everyone. The person you're repulsed by, your Nineveh, all those people that you just don't think are worthy of the gospel, that are worthy of forgiveness, guess what? God has said, no, you're wrong. 
This was a pivotal moment in church history. And Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And back to that question, you're Nineveh. Those sinful actions, those lifestyles that repulse you, when is it, where is it in Scripture that says they have to clean up first before they get forgiven? Doesn't, doesn't the gospel teach that it is God who cleans up? Isn't the gospel, isn't, and the gospel is the Old and New Testament together, we just have to understand it. Didn't God say that the time was coming, which was the gospel? When I will take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. Man who could not behave, who could not obey, was going to be able to obey God's principles with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Why can't we just trust God in this process? You know the message, verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So here's Peter to these Gentiles preaching Jesus. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. So he just preaches Jesus. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, and here it is, verse 44, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. See, they needed a sign, these Jewish believers who were biased against the Gentiles needed a sign that yes, the gospel is for the Gentiles. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. See, that's the monumental moment. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So they're speaking in tongues. There's evidence of the Holy Spirit. They believe in Jesus. And guess what he still does? Baptism. So they, he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So isn't that an interesting little statement? Surely no one can stand in the way. Who do you stand in the way of? And maybe it's not just that you don't think somebody is worthy. Maybe it's just by your inaction. Maybe it's by your fear or your comfort or whatever. There are things you just don't do because you're too comfortable where you are. Or you love the church just the way it is. It's made for us. We don't want to make room for anyone else. I've heard all kinds of things in church over the years. I've heard uh, that... Uh, uh, at it, uh, it, uh, one particular type of service that was more family oriented that there were people who said if the old folks show up we won't come and I've heard the old folks say no there's only a few kids we don't need to do anything for them or just those choices about music or just making things for our own comfort we do that all the time don't we we kind of stand in the way of this machine, this, this thing called the church that's meant to be witnesses of Christ in a dark world. Let no one stand in the way. So as we wrap this up, here's just a few verses to remind us of everything that Jesus said. 
John 14, 21, Jesus is in the upper room and he's with his disciples. It might be the Garden of Gethsemane. He kind of moved to the garden uh, in the midst of this night teaching these things. So John 14, 21, he says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So you're not making, mis- uh, uh, you're not making excuses. You're not uh, uh, dodging the bullet. You're not... Uh, well, you're not just too much in your comfort zone. No, you have the commands and you follow them. That's the one who loves Jesus. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. What's he telling us? Remember, that also includes includes the, the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. What's this all tell us? Love for Christ, and that's dosed with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What's it do? It makes love. It begets love. It keeps on coming. If you're truly in love with God, you have to be in love with people. No matter how imperfect they are, you're going to be in love with them. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you what? Love one another. So I think this is a great moment for the Lord's Supper. Because this is love, isn't it? I mean, it's the story of love. It's a reminder every week. And I think we need reminders because we're really good at forgetting, aren't we? John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Father, as we take this bread as we remember the sacrifice of your son for us, I just pray, Father, that we're humbled by it. That your Holy Spirit just guides us into love for our neighbor the way it ought to be. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. And then, as we get ready to take the cup, this little passage, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, by the way, that also means while we were repugnant in our sins to God, as we were unworthy of his forgiveness, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Father, for this blood covenant, we truly give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you will, let's stand. Be dismissed. I'm going to leave you with this last little point. You know, one of the big fallacies, I think, in church leadership is this idea that you have to give people ownership. It's this idea that, uh, that folks really get plugged into a church by owning the church. Actually, I think it opens up new problems. Because when we do take ownership, we start to say this and mine, and this is us, and you know, this, no, it's not for them. We start to truly take ownership. The truth is, if we really want to understand what the church, the gospel is all about, we do need to take a type of ownership. We need to own the stewardship granted us in Jesus' ministry. This is his ministry. This is his church. Someone else sweated and bled and sacrificed for what we have here. You will sacrifice and and sweat and bleed for what's here while you're here. And someone else will benefit from those sacrifices later on. But hopefully, if we do it right, they do the same thing. You're here because someone else shared the gospel with you. See, it's Jesus' ministry. It's his gospel. He's the one who does the cleaning up. We're just given a gift that's to be given away to others. Aren't we? Father, we just pray that as we leave these doors, we truly look at our world through your eyes. 
May we have compassion as you have compassion. May we see them, yes, harassed and helpless, sinful, broken, just as we were. But Father, may we also see that they are like sheep without a shepherd. And Father, give us the boldness, the strength. May we be proper stewards to introduce them to the only shepherd, Jesus himself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You all be blessed. Have a great Father's Day.